But if no questions, all right, we stopped at this one point and we talked about the idea of domination along with the identity components, right? So the identities... Um, x plus 0 is x, x dot 1 is x, and the domination, which would be x plus 1 is 1, x dot 0 is 0. Using these two things with considering the operator on the tables. So if I would have, say, x and y, so one one zero zero. Actually, think about yeah. The book starts off with ones. One zero one zero. If I do x plus y, x dot y, one 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 zero, one zero zero zero. One of the things that we could talk about is who's unique there in that table? Yep. So in discrete one, you're saying that we should start with zeros? No. I mean, I've been doing zeros. Normally, you do what? You do true, true, false, false. That's discrete one. There aren't any bit operators. Um, honestly, on bits, the order doesn't matter if we write that way or we write this way as long as we get to that particular thing. So I just did it this way because I looked at the book and it's like, oh, they start at once, so start at once for the example. Um, I think digital design, don't they always start at zeros? They do zeros. And I've been doing zeros, I think. They go ones first, then zeros? No, they don't. Because you come from zero. Oh, two, three, four. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. It's just in, in digital design, you start with zero because it's the logical expression of zero, and then you go up to one. And you go up one. Zero, yeah. one, yeah. one, zero, one, one. But in, in the end, none of the order of this doesn't even matter, right? No. Right? Because what's happening is, and that would be something where, if I, I haven't done this, is where I ought to do things like this for people that they always tend to memorize stuff. <laughs> you know, where I would do that. And it's completely mix up the rows and then make you fill it out. Because too often people say, what is it? True, false, true, true. Why is that? Well, it's just true, false, true, true. No, don't memorize patterns. No, this and this become this. You know, it's left to right, not up to down. The up and down doesn't matter. These are completely independent. And at this point, they're not that complicated that, you know, people write ones and zeros, I'm okay. On the other hand, true, false tables, I like true going first because... Then I start to do pattern recognition for grading, which is exactly the opposite of what I should be doing, right? <laughs> I just say, it's like, I want you not to memorize, but what I do is I memorize the answer, and I look and say, does it work? So I can go through this as fast as possible, which is why that's, that happens because we don't have apprenticeships. I need to have three students, and that's it. Right? And I have you for four years, and then you're a math major, and then I pick up another three. All right, so who's unique in this column? <laughs> so in this entire column, who's unique and why? The zero. The zero's unique, right? And so why is zero unique? Why are, why are, ones, why are ones everywhere else? What's special about the or that only has a zero at one time? Both of them have to zero. Both of them have to zero. Why? Because or is if any of them are one. Right. Because of domination. Zero is unique because x plus 1 equal 1, which is the domination law, The only way for an or to ever spit out a zero is if everybody was zero. At any other time, we're going to get a one. Why? Because one dominates, because of the domination law. On the other hand, if I look at this particular column, who's unique? The one is unique. Why? 
right? Both of those have to be one to be one because the domination law. X times zero is zero, which is a domination law. All right. So just looking at, if I have only x, y, this is a what term? If I add every possible literal, it forms a what term? Expression. It's an expression, but we call this expression a particular name, which would be a max term. If it's, pro, if it's, oh. it's a min term, minimal, it's, think about this way. If we write it, if we do all pluses, it's really big, max. <laughs> If you write all dots, those are small. They kind of crimp packs together. Those are min. All right? Think about it that way. If I write a bunch of pluses, it makes it really long. That's a max. If I write a bunch of dots. Dots use less space unless you're using uniform font size. Right? <laughs> and it compacts down, and so it's a min. Think about it that way. Now, let's look back at the x, y again. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And let's take the min terms, and I want to. There are going to be four min terms, which is every way to combine the literals. What are literals? They're either x or x bar, y or y bar. That's my literals. All right, what are all the min terms? I could do x, y, x dot y. What would be the next? What would be another min term? Say x dot y, x complement. What would be another one? And the last possibility? All right, so we have all those complements. Oops, didn't mean to do that. I didn't want white out. I want standard. There we go. Because otherwise it would have knocked out everything if I did a delete stroke. All right, so get these, get these, get these. All right. That would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. What would be this one? X bar, right? The complement of X would be what? 0, 0, 1, 1, right? And if I would dot that with Y, what would I get? I'd get 0, 0, 1, 0. If I took X, Y complement, what would I get? And if I did complement, complement. Notice any pattern about where the ones are? If I temporarily wrote, let's say, what's the x? It's 1, 1, 0, 0. What's y bar? 0, 1, 0, 1. Let's write the x bar, 0, 0, 1, 1. y bar, 0, 1, 0, 1. What do I notice? That it's where they're all ones, right? So, and what else do I notice? I have ones, but there's a one per row. So if I wanted to, I could pair a row with the min term that's a 1 on that row. So row 1, which midterm is associated with it? X, Y. Row 2, X, Y bar. Row 3, and what's row 4? All right, now look at these min terms that are associated with their individual rows. What do I notice? X, Y, 1, 1. X, Y bar, 1, 1. Right? <coughs> X bar, Y, 1, 1. X bar, Y bar, 1, 1. The same thing is going to happen. And so what I would look at this, and I notice that min terms have who is unique? 1. So I notice that if, if I ever have a 1 over here, I could figure out which min term is associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, if I have a one right there, I know which min term made that one. The min term associated with, I would just look across and say, oh, okay. So we can just go back and say, I have one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And say this is Q and that's S. And I go over here and I have a zero, one, zero, zero. And I would, say, I would look at that and I would say, you know what? What min term has to have generated that? Q, S bar. Why? Because that's the min term for that row. Who do min terms focus on? Ones. Why? Because ones are unique for min terms. Let's look at max terms. X, Y, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. If I would do X plus Y, X plus Y bar, X bar plus Y, X bar plus Y bar. X plus Y would be? Okay with that? If we would write it, remember what's the x? It's one, one, zero, zero. What's one bar? Zero, one, zero, one. What do I have? Uniqueness at zeros. Because max terms have uniqueness at zeros. If I would have the x bar, it would be zero, zero, one, one. The y it would be one, zero, one, zero. And I hey look, uniqueness at zeros. So again, for each of these, we have our our max term that's associated with the row, I have that this is x bar, y bar. I have that this guy was this x bar, y. I had this guy, which was x, y bar, and this was x, y. What, what's happening? If I have two zeros, it forms a zero, so that's that max term's row. x bar, y bar, that's zero, zero. What if I have one zero? How do I make it zero, zero? X bar, y. If I have zero, one, how do I make it zero, zero? X, y bar. Max terms focus on what? Focus on zero. This is important. Min terms. Focus on one. So now I can start putting this all together. If we have what's called a max, say a min term expansion, this would also be called min terms are what? A bunch of products. So this is going to be a sum of products. This is also called a sum of min terms. This is also called the disjunctive normal form. How does this all work? If I have my say S and Q and it's one one zero zero one zero one zero and I go through this and I have my function F my function F spits out a one zero zero one. And I want to focus on Min terms. Who do min terms focus on? Ones, right? Min terms focus on ones. <coughs> Who are the ones that I have? That and that. What is the min term that generates that top one? X, Y. Who is the min term that generates the bottom one? 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to not get into stuck into a pattern, which is a really good example. I got stuck in XY in my head, right? So if SQ is the thing that generates this one and S bar dot Q bar is the thing that generates the second one, then my function could simply be, re be represented as F as a function of S and Q. It's just simply S dot Q plus S star Q bar. Why? Because if this is ever a one, the entire thing's a one. And if they're both, they're both zero in these places, so it doesn't change those values. This is uniquely one here. This is uniquely one here. If either is a one, plus plus, doesn't matter, it spits out a one. So now I get both the ones. So I use the fact that under disjunction, one is a dominator, but it only occurs once, so it's fine. I wanted to put those all together. And so this thing gets all four of those names. It's a min term expansion. It's a sum of min terms. It's a sum of products. It's also called the disjunctive normal form. Why is it called the disjunctive normal form? Because the sum is disjunction, right? It's or. And normal, the normal forms mean that you're either using a min term or a max term. So it's a min term separated by disjunction. So Anytime any four of those combinations tells you this is what you would make, and what do you focus on? You focus on ones. Is everybody okay with taking a table and spitting out an expression? We can make it a little bit more complicated. Say x, y, and z. One, 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 zero, zero, zero. One, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Zero. And my function is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. What's the min term that generates that one right there? Uh, the x, y, z bar. That's when all these three things would end up being a 1, right? What is the min term that generates that one? I'll leave off the dots. We'll just assume that that's an implied operator. And what's the last one? X bar, Y bar, Z bar. And so what's my function? So the, so the, the second one is X, Y bar, Z bar. Oh, I, we said that, didn't we? So F is, as a function of X, Y, and Z, will be X, Y, Z bar plus X, Y bar, Z bar plus x bar, y bar, z bar. How many total expressions could we have written? And count un, sorry, a countably infinite number. But this is the one we want if we want a disjunctive normal form. Sum of products, sum of min terms, min term expansion. Is everybody okay with that? Well, what if one of the reasons why I like this sum of min terms is because there's only three ones, and because there's only three ones, I'm only going to have three things, three min terms in my entire problem because I focus on the guy, focus on the ones. Well, what if we would have a different problem and instead of having a sum of products, we want to use our max terms, right? And so we would like to have a, a product of sums. That's also a product of max terms, that's also called our max term expansion. Or last one, it's the conjunctive normal form. All meaning the same thing. So let's say we went and had x, y, z, one, 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 zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, whoops. One zero zero. One zero one zero one zero one zero. And then my function is a zero zero one 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 one. Eh, let's do a zero on that one. One. If I focus on zeros, what's the max term that spits out that zero? 
x bar plus y bar plus z bar. If you don't say anything, the assumption is right, which is, and then this last one. So therefore, f, what's the degree of this function? How many variables do you see? Three, so that's the degree. Okay. The degree of Boolean functions is how many variables you see. And so this would be, now what do I do with those? I multiply them together. So that means we have x bar plus y bar plus z bar x bar plus y bar plus z, and then x plus y plus z bar. And that is the conjunctive normal form. On the other hand, I could have written this in the disjunctive normal form. What would be the disjunctive normal form? You would focus on the ones. Who would, what would generate this first one? x, y bar, z. x, y bar, z. So it would be x, y bar, z plus x, y bar, z bar plus x bar, y, z x bar, y, z plus x bar, y, z bar plus x bar, y bar, z bar. And those would all be the exact same thing. Now, um, max term expansions, min term expansions, uh, a lot of times in programming classes they would say things like, if I had f of x, y, z and my answer was x, y, you would say, well, that's and say plus x, z. In a circus class, they would say, well, that's a sum of products. And the answer is, no, it's not. Sum of products in this class is you need to see all of the variables, right? Every min term can't get away with just two things. Every min term must have all three variables. If we have three variables. If you have three variables. So that's one of the things like this would not be a sum of products because the first thing's missing a z of some sort and the last thing's missing a y of some sort. So let's say we had that, right? So one way that we can take problems and do a min term, max term expansion is to go from table and then just read off the answer. That's awesome, right? You just generate the table and then go ahead and make your, pick your min term, max terms, whichever one you want. But if I was given something like this, could I use algebra to Boolean algebra to take this and put this into a sum of products? sum of products. It's definitely Friday. Well, the problem is, for this, where's my z? And for this, where's my y? Now, I'm not allowed just to throw a z in there or throw a y in there. There is something that we can put on things. What can I put in there so it doesn't change it? What's the identity of, well, don't do that yet. <laughs> what are we allowed to put in under multiplication? One. So I just can't do anything I want. I have to say that this is equal to x times y times one. Plus, what would this one be? x times one times, I'll just put it in the middle because that's where the y would normally go. So I can multiply by one, right? Because that is the identity of that operator. Now, I'm not going to pick one. What, what am I going to pick for the one? Something with z, which is, what's a one? Z plus z bar. Z plus z bar is one. And now this is x, y plus y bar, z. Right? I put in one in a particular way. Now what would you do? Use distribution law. So the first thing, I, what was the law of this equality? Why is that equal? What law did I use? I multiplied by one, but what law is that? The identity, right? The fact that these are one is the complement law, right? And then we use distribution and get x, y, z it plus x, y, z bar plus x, y, and so I could distribute and then distribute both sides, right? I'll just do it so at the same time. Z, not, what do you, which one? 
You can just put the X and Z on the side and then distribute together. Yeah, I mean, or distribute from the left or distribute from the right. But we don't. I suppose we don't have right distribution and commutative. And anyways, but this would be plus x y bar z. Now what? That with associativity with commutativity, I can flip, and that's that plus itself, which is say it once, right? The idempotent law. Those are are there two of them? My name is Mark, or my name is Mark. What do we say? My name is Mark. And therefore, we only have the three, because those two under idempotent, I only have to write it once. There is no such thing as two. In Boolean algebra, there is no such thing as two, right? Because it's either zero or one. That's, just, that's all the stuff I have. Well, I got two of them. That, doesn't even, that makes no sense. That doesn't exist. <laughs> Everybody okay with that form? And so we could do the same thing with the other parts. All right. So if we want to go this idea of the expansions, either one, we can use a table. Focus on one. When do you fo if you see ones, who, who spits out the ones? Min terms, right? So sum of min terms. If you focus on zeros, who are you focusing on? Max terms. Max terms. So we either use the tables or two, use the Boolean algebra laws. Like that right here. Take another example of that Boolean algebra laws. Say f of x, y, and z is equal to x plus y. <laughs> I need, and I want to see a product of sums which means I'm looking for max terms. If I'm looking for max terms, I need to, a max term has all three variables separated by addition. And they're either the variable or the complement of the variable. So what is this guy missing? Z. It's missing a Z, right? And so what can I do to it? I can add zero. But what is adding zero? What's a zero that we can use? Now, this is where if we would depict different operators, life would be a little bit easier. If I would have said this is x or y or parenthesis, Z and Z bar. What would you do? You would simply take this and then do what? You would distribute and say that this is X or Y or Z and X or Y or Z bar. So everybody okay with that distribution? So I took this, right? and added zero to it. The hard part about this is to, under, this is where we get that whole confusion thing going on. This is equal to x plus y plus z times x plus y plus z bar. Because this will distribute through and get that operator. College algebra doesn't allow this, but this is not college algebra, this is Boolean algebra. So we get this guy right there. That is now a product of max terms. Each max term has all three variables as a literal. This is also where having parentheses makes your life a little bit easier. Because you can start to see the grouping of how they go through.
notice again, this kind of gets down to as just a little reminder. A lot of times we see this. This is rather easy to see. Because it acts like college algebra's normal distribution. This is the second type of distribution that, all, that exists within Boolean algebras. So we have to be remembering that these things with the operator distribute, leaving this as the middle operator. The same thing happens. You have to kind of divorce your history a little bit. All right, the last thing that we can now talk about was this idea of the tables. If I go back to these tables and I had, say, my x and my y, and 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and I had my function f, whatever it was, right? I know that I have a possibility of 2 to the 4th, which is 16 total unique tables for any of the functions. For the uncount you know, the countably infinite ways of writing these expressions, on the other hand, there's a unique way to write a min term expansion, there's a unique way to write a max term expansion, right? We would just pick the min term expansion or max term expansion. Those would be expressions. Those are unique, right? On the other hand, there's only 16 of these tables that would ever exist, so there's 16 unique ways of doing these expansions. Um, picking either the min or the max term, I could make it as complicated as I want, all the way out to an infinite number of versions. But we could ask one of the questions that you have here is we notice is because min term and max term expansions handle all 16, right? All, literally. There's, there's only 16 possible functions that would exist. I could write for all 16 the min term expansion or the max term expansion for every single one of them, always. But what do I notice about the operators? One of the questions that we've had is in logic, we have and, or, and not. But does logic have more operators than that? We had exclusive or. We had conditionals, if x, then y. We had biconditionals, x, if and only if y. So we could have more operators, but will those operators actually get us anything new? Well, when we look at this, these particular expansions, they only use what? Dot, plus, and not. So if only dot, plus, and not can create all the functions that would ever exist, we would say that those operators are obviously enough, right? We call the set dot, plus, not to be functionally complete. Because that's all I need. What are all functions? Functions are just a table. Right? This, out, this input causes this output. That table can have an expression, but those expressions can be written by only using dot, plus, and not. Well, common technique in math is, can we go lower? Is this as small as we can get? Could we get a smaller set? So only three operators. If only three operators are functionally complete, can we go down? Can we have, you know, like, can this dot plus and not be reduced?
and still be functionally complete. Well, I have two laws. Q bar bar is what? Q. Q. Second one. X or Y bar is what? If I put both of those together, then X or Y bar bar would have to be X bar Y bar bar. But X plus Y bar bar is what? X plus Y. So what does that say? That says if I ever have a plus, I can actually write it as what? The knot of the x and the knot of the y, not. So complement x and complement y, complement. So that says that given any plus, it would become a dot not. So is plus actually needed? No. Every plus that you see, it won't look as pretty. <laughs> but I could go back and only use ands in complement. So that tells me this is functionally complete. That means every possible binary function can be handled with an and in a knot. So can't we do the same with like plus and bar? Yep. But since we have De Morgan's law of x, y naught is x naught or y naught, that implies that x, y is actually x complement, y's complement, complement. So if I was rather given any dot, it would become pluses and complements. So plus naught is also functionally complete. Which kind of leads to kind of an interesting question. Wait a second. If plus as an operator and complement as an operator together, only those two can handle all functions, could I make a new operator that was just those two operators jammed together? Like a NAND or a NOR. And so we will now define x lower arrow y to be simply x or y complement. I'll just jam the two together. So what is this? This is just the, the flip. The nor is 1, 1, 1, 0. This would become 0, 0, 0, 1. And it ends up being that if you want to write all this fun stuff out, the complement is simply x nor x. So if you want to complement an operator, you nor it with itself, and that's the same thing as negating it. If you wanted to add, well, addition is the negation of that, and negation is the nor with itself. So that would tell me that this has to be just x nor y nord <coughs> with x nor y. If you nor something with itself, you negate it. And since the nor is the not or, you negate the not or, you're back to the or. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Then we go back up to here. What's the and? It's the not of the not of x or the y, which is the not of the not. So those knots would cancel, and so therefore, x and y would be just simply x nor x nor y nor y. Doesn't look pretty, but what happens? If I would take a min term or max term expansion or whatever, whatever thing that had only obviously nots, ors, and ands, every time I saw an or, if I rewrote that thing, 
And if I saw an and, I rewrote that, and I saw a not, and I rewrote that, and I put those all together, I could, hand, I could do everything with the nor. And so that tells us the set of only the nor is functionally complete, which means that in circuits, circuits are what? Zeros and ones go in, and a zero and one comes out, right? That's all a function is. You have inputs of a stream of zeros and ones and out comes out on off. So that means everything can be handled with a NOR gate. And correspondingly, the NAND gate is XY's complement and then X complement is X NAND, X, X or Y is going to be X NAND, y, nand, x, nand, y, and then x and y is, uh, oops, sorry, that's x, x, y, that's x, nand, y, nand, x, nand, y, because it's the not of the nand, which is the flip of the, the negation of the, the and, and so the plus would be just simply, again, by the Morgans, we get that, and so, also is functionally complete. It isn't pretty, but it's functionally complete. That means how many transistors do you need to be able to create? Which, which gate do you need to be able to make to do all possible things that you ever want to do? A NAND or a NOR, that's it. So if that's the only thing that you can make, that's fine. Anything that you could ever do, ever, can be entirely done with a NAND or entirely done with a NOR. And there's this thing running around in the back of my mind, and I keep looking, I can't find it, is when the transistors first came out after vacuum tubes, one of the things that happened was, it was a discussion of why, right? We have a working technology. Why does this new technology have to go to, compared to this working technology? And so nobody would switch over. And so they, they, had the, they sent a couple of guys, I believe this was IBM at the time, they sent some guys into a room and say, all right, we need to demo, right? You need to go and convince people that you, you need to use this new gate design. You know, to, and so the guy sat down and was like, okay, we're going to make a calculator. And so wrote out the entire calculator design on the blackboard in the room, I believe it was just in NOR gates, and, said, and then said, okay, then after they got, would this all work? Yes, it all worked. And then they wrote it down and they sent it off to fabrication. And, and they had, didn't even, you also have to work around failures, right? Because all, not all the gates will work when you do things like that. But it worked. And so then here's our demo box transistor calculator. It doesn't need to be based upon these other electronics. And so I always thought it was interesting. And I, I saw it once and I've never been able to, nobody's, it was a long time ago. And it hasn't been put on YouTube. I've been trying to find it. You know, who was the author and the guy that wrote that, and it was in the talk. But it's kind of interesting to sit there and say, did a whole four function calculator on the chalkboard using only NOR? Might have been NAND, but I'll say NOR. When you're wrong, be confident with your wrongness, right? I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if you could have done it either. Right, it doesn't matter because they're functionally complete. Why would you pick one over the other? Because at the time, their gates. You know, picking these particular NAND and NOR, you know, having these particular effects. You just need to have one work. Once you do that, you can then start building upon it over time. But first time out, I only need one. And then you can go ahead and through, go through that. So, any questions on this? So now we're officially done with, I suppose, the computationals off to its own and circuits. And you can go ahead and Obviously, most people are actually already done. Read the rest of Chapter 12, just because it's actually useful to know. What we're going to move on to now is why this subject is kind of like the prereq to beginning what it means to be in computer science. Right? You're not in programming. You're not in applications of programming. You're in computer science. Why is this computer science? It's the study of what computation really is. So what we're going to do is we're going to study human language and how the study of human language with graphs becomes the study of computer science. So that's what we'll hit next. All right, that's it.
That's for 